All right. So I'm going to ask everyone that's that's uh, tried to download a SegWi file uh, to just stop for a minute to make sure that we don't have a bunch of people at once trying at the same time that I do. So hopefully mine will work. Um, if it doesn't work, then I'll uh, have to shuffle things over from my Google Drive folder. Okay. So it looks like mine has had to, yeah. All right. So I'm going to go over to my own Google Drive folder. And I'm going to get a copy out of my own Google Drive folder, which is not, you know, I guess what everyone else has going on. And I'm going to stop sharing in case this shows any uh, security stuff for a second. So I've got my own Google Drive folder mounted now. Um, oops. So I've got that mounted at content slash drive. And then I'm going to navigate down into my own files. So I go to content drive, my drive. And then I'm going to look for this copy that I stored of the file. So I have copy of Porotomo IDAS. I'm going to rename this file real fast just so it's just Porotomo IDAS, like what some of you all downloaded. And then scroll down to that. Here we go. So I've got this Porotomo IDAS file. It's coming from my own Google Drive. So sorry to those of you that haven't been able to download it at this point, but um, all right. So down here, what this means is I'm going to be accessing this from slash content slash drive slash protomo idas blah, blah, blah. So it's just a little change to the name here, and it's just specifying this path within my files. So those of you who are able to maybe download it locally and put it onto your Google Drive folder, uh, hopefully this will work. This is not an issue I've run into before, so debugging on the fly in front of 100 plus people, uh, it happens. You're doing great, Eileen. <laughs> okay, so it looks like it's still having a little difficulty with finding it. It's having a file not found error. Okay, so I'm going to double check my files. I'll look over here. I've got content, drive, and then I have to go to my drive. Okay. I should be saying that. Don't you know? so, what's that? No errors yet, just waiting. All right, I didn't get any errors, awesome. Okay, so it looks like for those of you who um, are able to get a copy onto your Google Drives, uh, or if, you if you're able to get it and you're able to share that with other people who um, have had trouble getting it um, within your breakout rooms, this will be the solution you'll use. So. You just go into your files, click up here onto this drive uh, icon up here that's the folder with the triangle, and then um, that should be good. So, all right. So let's just to make sure that we have all the right 
dimensions and everything. Um, we're going to print that out. So we've read our data over here. We've got some just basic information from the headers from the obspy package. So we read this in using obspy's segy reader here. There's a couple of different versions of that. So I've also put an alternative version down below. And then we're gonna use the stats for the data stream that has many traces. We're just gonna grab the first trace within that data stream. And then we're gonna choose the, uh, or get the header information from that first trace. But these are things that are common to all of the traces. So, okay. So I know, Nate, we've got some time right now for Q&A on downloading the data. I think we've done a lot of downloading data Q&A already just through the break and everything. Uh, did you see anything in the chat that I should address? I was muted. Um, there was a question about um, how you actually got this geometry file. Um, like, is it given by the fiber company? Or is it generated by um, a survey from scientists? Or how did, how, where did this geometry file actually originate from? That's a great question. It's, uh, for those of us that have worked on experiments, it's um, kind of a manually intensive process. A lot of times with the surface arrays, we're going around and we have a known location where we're gonna do something like a hammer shot or some other loud controlled vibration at a known time. And that's gonna tell us, based on which channels are responding right away, that are right next to that, which channels are at that location. And then we do this in many locations, and then we just do simple linear interpolation between those points, and that helps us to figure out what our geometry is. Um, in wells, it gets more complicated. Maybe Nate, you'll comment on that a bit later. Um, but that's, that's kind of the basic idea. We do a lot of locations where we just hit a controlled source to figure out the location. Great. Um, there's a question about uh, SegY format. So was this an active source format um, survey or is that why it's SegY or, or did, are there other types of data for DAS? Yeah, that's a, a good for question also. Um, so SegY is, uh, something that's commonly used for active source. And we're actually reading in a file here that was during a viber size shot. And so, or I guess shot isn't quite the right word, but a viber size source. So a big truck goes out, hits the ground repeatedly with a controlled source. And so it's kind of geared towards short segments of time. So these are 30 second files. Um, for longer recordings, people will sometimes use SAC or other formats like um, people use uh, various types of HDF5 formatting, like ASDF or things like that as well. Um, yeah. Um, great. So um, Laura has, has a very um, apt question. Do you often work with data that's hosted on some server rather than downloading it? It really varies on the situation. Um, so typically, I work with data that's uh, on some HPC cluster, and so I almost never download data to my own laptop to work with it. Um, so I'm always working remotely with it, but oftentimes that means that I've plugged in some hard drives, um, but there's different workflows. For instance, at the Stanford DAS array, data were acquired by an interrogator. They were shuffled down for a copy down in Southern California and uh, a little bit of processing, I think, and then they would come back to uh, the Supercomputing Center for Earth Science at Stanford for us to actually work with there. And so that was one workflow. Um, there's another experiment I'm working on with uh, researchers in Zurich and they take hard drives of data from the field. They load them onto AWS cloud servers and then I access them and do compute there. So these are different types of models for working with data. Um, there's not a one size fits all when it's this large. Um, for Lawrence Berkeley Lab, there's a lot of hard drives that get attached um, to a cluster that's designated with something like one and a half petabytes of data um, that all of the researchers working on those data sets log into remotely to work with. So, yeah. Um, so there's, as I'm going through, um, more questions. Is there any, uh, 
Yeah, so I guess um, one thing I noted was that um, some folks described a wget line that worked, um, many folks actually. So I don't know if that's, um, if you know so what they're referring to, but that seemed like a I'm common. referring to maybe this line up here that goes to the geothermal data repository. Yeah, maybe okay. they, maybe that's like a couple people tried that, so maybe that yeah. was okay. It'll, uh, it'll work for a little while. It's probably going to start to crash pretty quickly. Um, so maybe like right now, if your last name is between the letters A and G, go ahead and try that link if you haven't gotten to get the data yet. Um, in a couple of minutes, I'll designate a time for H through N. Then I'll designate a time for O through V, and then W through Z for the last time. Um, so as I'm going through, I'll just give you a designated time when it's your turn to try out that W get line. Uh, that's always worked for me, but um, you know there are times when it has a really high load that it will break and it's only meant for like a few dozen people. So I think we want to keep that load as low as possible. And if you were able to get the data onto um, your own Google Drive folder, uh, don't use that wget line for this chunk of time right now. Yeah. Great. Well, um, let's go on and look at what we can actually do with this data now that we've read it in. Um, so we checked, we've got the right dimensions. We have our geometry. Each point has an X location in meters, a Y location in meters, and a channel. And uh, so we've got 8,620 locations or channels. Um, many of these channels are actually overlapping a little bit because the gauge length is longer than the channel spacing. Um, our array dimensions here for our whole data, we've got 8,621 sensors, so our row is our sensor, and then our column designates our point in time. So we've got 30,000 samples in time that are spread out over this 30-second record, so 1,000 samples per second. All right, now we're going to use just the regular obspy plotting function. So I'm just going to choose a channel, plot it as a wiggle plot. But we have this issue that we've got 8,000 something channels. And uh, so with that many channels, uh, these wiggle plots get incredibly hard to look at. So um, my rule of thumb is if I have like 50 channels or more, I don't like to look at a wiggle plot. I like to look at what's called a raster plot. So let's go down. And here we've got a function defined that's gonna plot our data in space and time as a raster plot in red, white, blue color scale. So white is gonna designate there's no extension or compression happening at that point. Uh, then we've got red and blue to designate whether it's extension or compression on either side. Um, and so that's gonna plot a part of the data from some time in seconds from min to max time, and then some, time, or some subset of channels from min to max channels. And we can specify our title and we have to specify a sample rate so that if you want to reuse these tools later, you can reuse them pretty easily for any survey. So I haven't hard coded information like sample rate in here. So that's just going to use the matplotlib im show function to create that raster plot. So let's do this for our viber size sweep. And I've just got the old visual in here from before, but I'll go ahead and run this. It's gonna go through all of my channels from zero up to my number of traces in TR. And it's gonna go the entire time, so zero through seconds per record. But you could change these. You could say, I just wanna look at a little segment. Maybe I just want one second to uh, seconds per record. I'll have one to five seconds. And I could remake this and look at just that shorter period, just as the fiber size is starting up. I'm gonna change this back into zero to seconds per record. So when we're looking at this visual, the thing to note is there's these different segments that all seem to highlight or to, to light up as the fiber size is going off. So uh, the reason for that, if we go back to our geometry, we've got this big zigzag pattern that happens and we've got these little zigzags within it, but these big zigzags we basically got from south to north on channels like zero to 3,000-ish. Then we've got from north to south again, 
and then it zigzags back from south to north again. So that's why we get these three kind of regions of channels that light up in response to the viper size. There's also another viper size source that starts partway at the, at the end of this file that you'll notice. Um, so if you were to just want to work with one viper size, you would mute out this last chunk here. All right. If we zoom in really close, let's say that I want to do like five to six seconds. I can really see how those waves are moving out throughout the entire array here, but it's still not super intuitive for a lot of people. So one of the other things that I like to do for plotting these, are these data on sort of unusually shaped arrays is I like to do time snapshots. So I've got a function here called plot time snapshot where you specify uh, your channel geometry and you say, here's my data and here's the particular point in time that I want to look at. And I want to look at that data mapped onto all of my geometry. So from there, I can say, I want to look at 3.5 seconds into my shot or into my viper size source recording. And then I'm going to plot it. And I see a scatter plot that's colored by what is the intensity of the extension or compression at each point in time. And in fact, we can create what's called a widget. This is just kind of a fun thing in Jupyter Notebooks where you're able to sort of change um, how you interact with the plot so that you don't have to keep putting in what the time is specifically. You just create this little function that then you say, I just want to look at different time snapshots. And I'm going to be able to adjust this widget to look, say, at 4.5 seconds into the fiber size source. If I look 13 seconds in, is it starting to die off? It's over a smaller region. If I look at 17 seconds in, it's really starting to die off there. And eventually, it's pretty much going away. So at 24 seconds, that's really the end of any of the vibrations from this particular uh, viber size source. So we don't see any more. So you can see it kind of growing over time. So you can play around with that a bit. Great. So we've also got some functions down here to look at different subsets. And so um, with this, you're able to uh, change this cell up to look at different subsets of the channels. So if you just want to zoom in on a little piece of the geometry, you can do that. And then if you wanted to say zoom in on a particular time, uh, which I've set in the cell above here. So if I wanted to look at just seven to eight seconds, let's say, then if I want to zoom in on a particular time, I just run this plot space time down here to look at these different parts. And you notice that some parts respond much stronger than others. And even among parts that are kind of uh, sort of in the same direction and location, there's a lot of variability in how strongly they respond. And in fact, this has to do a lot with what is the geometric response of DAS fibers and what is the coupling of the cable into the ground at that location. So this is still like really an active area of research to figure out best practices in the field for getting you know, totally uniform coupling You'll also notice that you get quick and very small changes at some of the corners. So as you're starting to look at these questions like how do you map the geometry to the actual channel numbers, that's how you do it. You're going to start looking like really zooming in on some of these small features at different channels and different subsets of time to try to pinpoint where those corners are. And you can compare to the geometry up here that's plotted. So, uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to go into our small groups. Those of you who were not able to um, actually download the file easily, um, I guess we'll go ahead and say if your last name is H through N, go ahead and do it now. If your last name is O or later, try in five minutes to use that wget link that people have posted. Um, but we're going to go into breakout rooms and hopefully the people in your breakout room uh, will have been able to download it. So maybe you all can screen share and uh, get, a, get to look and talk more about uh, what's going on in different parts. So um, what I want you all to discuss during this breakout room session where you're going to have a little bit bigger group is um, some of these questions here. So, uh, you know, whichever ones you think are interesting, um, go ahead and explore those. Um, as you note different features, feel free to post stuff in the Brady Hot Springs channel 
on the Slack. Um, we'd love to see what you all are up to and also you can compare and kind of crowdsource answers with other groups. So uh, at this point, I think we can go into the breakout group rooms.